Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, somebody asked me to put up uh, a bit of an explanation about shimming in gearboxes. I, I'm reluctant to tell people how to do this in, in great detail because it's an intricate thing. Uh, I was taught by Michael Schnering. You've heard me mention his name many times, I'm sure. Uh, he is a mentor of mine and a very, very dear friend of mine. And you'll find in professions like these that oftentimes uh, people in the trades have got people that they turn to to discuss things that change or that they might not understand or get outcomes uh, that they weren't expecting and, and talk through what might have caused it. Michael is that go-to for me. We are also great friends and we've spent many, many times, days and days together sitting, scratching our heads over some of the little challenges that come up with these things. But I'm going to try and explain why you need the shims and why they are so critical to the operation of the gearbox. This here is a, is a plate. It's a, it's a Cycleworks made plate. I bought it years ago. I thought about getting them made. I stuffed around. Uh, these are as good as you buy. Uh, they're great people to deal with, they make some very good tools um, and uh, I recommend them highly. Um, this plate is nominally 750,000 uh, thick. I've had people tell me that their plates are out here and there and everywhere else. I haven't found that. Uh, but with these gearboxes and specialised tools that you use, you'll often find variations in things. But if you're using them all the time, and this will be about the fourth gearbox I've done in the last 10 days, maybe the fifth, no it's the fourth, um, you get used to the gear that you use and you get used to how it reads and what it does so you sort of can you know compensate for those any variations that might be there which you'll pick up just from experience but how does it work let me get on with it this here is the back of the gearbox housing it's a machine surface precision machined and flat you also have the back of the uh, the gearbox housing which goes on there which I'll get out and show you a little later in the video this is a powder coated black and it gives me the shivers trying to put it together without hurting it, which, uh, but we'll manage it. So what you're trying to do is when the plate goes on the back here and closes the gearbox up, these three shafts go into recesses at the back uh, of the gearbox, machined into the back housing of the gearbox. And you need to have an amount of end float or free play in each of these three shafts to make sure that the gearbox doesn't lock up or flog itself to death by slapping backwards and forwards inside the case. That, in effect, is what setting up a standard end float is. And you use shims, little round metal rings of varying thicknesses, to pack in around the ends of these bearings to create a gap between the end of the bearing and the back housing of the gearbox, the depth of the machining, which is in line with the specifications laid down by the manufacturer. That in effect is what you are doing. In these two shafts here there are two oil baffle plates in the other end so when you put the shafts in they are automatically sticking up the depth of the machining plus the amount of those baffle plates. There is another baffle plate that goes on the intermediate shaft here and those baffle plates are actually covers that go over little depth holes in, in each end of the gearbox which fill up with oil and run oil down the shafts uh, when the gearbox is rotating. That's what they're there for. So what you're trying to do is calculate what size shim you need to put on the back of each of the, these three bearings between the end of these three bearings and the depth of machining in the back housing of the gearbox to correct to uh, set up the exact amount of end float that the gearbox requires to function correctly, smoothly and not lock up quite an intricate little job. You have an aluminium housing, you have steel gears, they expand at different rates so effectively what you're doing is you're setting up a gearbox, you have to heat the housing at the back to get it on, you have to heat the housing at the front to get these two shafts in, the intermediate and the output shaft. So you're setting up something that is cold, a certain end me measurement that will heat up and the expansion of the case will be different to the steel uh, shafts in the gearbox and that will, when the gearbox is at operating temperature, give you the correct end float, if you do it properly, uh, to make the gearbox function at its absolute best. So what you're doing here is you're measuring the height of that bearing above that back. Now it's very impossible to do with a ruler or anything else, so you use a shim plate of a known depth. You put a gasket in here, that's nominally 8 thou, 8 to 10 thou. You put the gasket on, you put the plate on, you drop it down over the bearings. There are pins here. These are bolted down when I'm doing it to make sure there's no so, so slop. 
and then you use uh, a micrometer now I use a digital one uh, because my eyes aren't as good as they used to be I have two others but this one is the one that I use it I, I measure in thousands of an inch because I'm old and I understand them and you measure the depth down here from the top of this plate which you know if it's a 10 thou gasket and 750 thou thick you know that that depth is 760 thou and you measure the depth of the top of that bearing rim there I usually measure it in three or four places around each bearing and I record it on a sheet of paper which again I'll show you in a moment or two I'm just going to pause this video for a second now so this is the back of the backing plate and then what you do once you've measured that distance that I showed you just a minute ago you measure the depth down here to where the bearings sit in the backing plate now bear in mind in this one here this is a blind hole and the hole at the opposite end in this case is blind also there is a shim that will go in there to create the correct end float between that machining at the end and the face of the bearing it has to have a certain amount of clearance this is the input shaft this is the output shaft so you set up the same depth gauge the caliper and you uh, not caliper the digital micrometer you set it up you zero it on this face here which is precision measured and you measure the depth down to those machinings and you record that on the same table that I'm going to show you in a moment then through a series of calculations you work out what the actual clearance is for each bearing and then you calculate what shim you need to use to get what the good book which is underneath this says that's a, a, a factory repair manual uh, I have about four of them but uh, essentially the measurements are the same uh, says should be and they are saying 5,000 in float throughout the gearbox so I'm going to turn this on its edge now I hope this will work here are the calculations that you need to make the plate plus the gear box gasket is 760,000 intermediate uh, input intermediate and output shafts you take the readings in the intermediate shaft you've got an oil baffle that goes on the back end here as well nominally that's 20,000 so you have to take that off the measurement that you take there because you're trying to work out how far these bearings are sticking up above there and therefore how far into there they will go so having done that you take away the gearbox extension plus in this case the gearbox extension and the baffle this already includes the gasket measurement and that gives you the gearbox bearing extension height above the back of the gearbox itself right to the nearest thou that you can calculate so you come down here and you write your measurements in for the depths of these holes again I shoot usually three or four around each one and I always take the smallest number because it's the shallowest so you don't want to take the biggest number because you might lock the gearbox up cross there and they are not always exactly equal they're sometimes out of thou or two and then down here you put the clearance the sorry the bearing extension number goes in there I haven't got my glasses on either which is making this even harder so what you have is the back housing depth the bearing extension depth you take one from the other and that figure there in that underline gives you the clearance between the outside of the bearing uh, and the the uh, bottoming on the back of the housing at the back of the gearbox and from that using five thou and your experience and knowledge and what happens you calculate in the end your shim value and write it in there then you go to your box of 6,000 shims all of which are never the ones that you exactly need and you get yourself a, a um, another micrometer and you um, set this up once again this is a this is a, uh, a digital one it measures down to uh, I think tenths of a thousandth of an inch um, and I use that because it has a nice big clear display and I can see it and I won't make a mistake with that age is not fun trust me but sometimes you can sit here for half an hour going I've probably got I don't know 100 shims or more going through these shims and working out uh, combinations of shims to get the right clearances and even then 
when you put the whole thing together, you put some grease on the top of these bearings and you stick your shims to them along with your baffle plate on this one after you've taken this plate off. Get it all ready, heat the housing up, drop it on the back and tap it down. And you can find you've got a tight input shaft or that the shims won't move around in under here. They're stuck and this is tight. You can't check this one. The only way you can check it is if this one is free and has the right amount of end float in that shim shaft that you're aiming for, you know, fairly well, as little in float in there as you can get, around two to three thou, four thou, they say five. Uh, same here. If the gearbox is tight, then you've got the shims too tight in this, so you've got to heat the back up, and generally when you heat the back up, if that is tight, and you undo the screws around the outside, it will pop up on this corner as you undo them. So you undo them in a crisscross pattern to keep them from buckling, and you'll find this corner will pop up if you've got those shims too tight. Trick is to pay particular attention to the shimming of that one because you've got no way of actually visually checking it once the gearbox is together. So if you get that, you put it all together and you find that this is this uh, has got very, very little in the way of uh, end float up and down that you can feel. Two thou sometimes. Um, that's plenty so long as it's free. And, and is not locking. Four thou is what I, you know, is, is, is what the book says is five thou. I find, and I believe, and Michael has taught me, um, that that's probably a bit loose. So I'm not suggesting you go and set up shims and things on my values. Please do not do that. This is an instructional video to try and show you what shimming is all about. Now, when you get the shims right, they're sitting in there, they're in the back of the gearbox, and you turn the gearbox over, it will turn freely but not sloppily. Everything will move correctly. These will be shimmed correctly. If you spend the time to shim them correctly, you will minimise the amount of end float in the gearbox or end float differential. You'll make the gearbox work the best way it can. My suggestion is, and my experience was, I've worked on these on tractors where, you know, the bloody shims are half a foot thick in some of them, the 1920s and 30s, and they're not precise instruments. These are the similar kind of gearbox in that they are a constant mesh sliding dog gearbox, but if you want your bike to work properly, the gearbox to work properly, you should get it shimmed properly and then do all the other little jobs that I showed you in a previous video. Um, you know, polish things and slide things, make sure all your gears are correct and in spec and not worn and not burred and yada 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 and that's why it takes a day and a half sometimes to build a gearbox if you want to build it properly by the time you strip it, inspect it, clean it to within an inch of its life, put everything back together, shim it up, take it apart two or three times if you don't feel it's right, get it back together again and then when you hand it back to the customer hopefully they are ecstatically happy. Ride safely, stay well until we meet again.